Hey everybody, in this problem uh, we are given an electric field and our goal is to find the charge density that causes that electric field up here. And again, this electric field is in uh, spherical coordinates. And so anytime that we're working with an electric field and we're trying to get to the charge configuration or the, um, or the, the charge density, we should immediately think about Gauss's law. Uh, probably um, one of the most recognizable ones of Gauss's law is this one is uh, the divergence of the electric field, so how much this uh, electric field, you know, diverges apart from whatever its charge configuration is. Again, it doesn't necessarily have to look like this, but um, the, the divergence of it is equal to the charge density with a proportionality fa factor of uh, epsilon naught right here. So all we have to do is take the um, divergence of this and then solve for the charge density and uh, we got our answer. So this is, um, we did a lot of divergence, I think, in, in chapter one. So this is one of the um, one of the times that we're going to be exercising it in uh, an actual problem. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just going ahead and, and just pasting for time um, the divergence of the electric field. And, and this is the only step I'll keep it in blue. But when this divergence operator in spherical coordinates acts on everything in white over here and everything in white is the uh, original electric field and everything is blue or the uh, this is the divergence operator operating on this electric field. Uh, what I didn't show is like the dot product that happens right here. So it's a, it's a dot product. So the R hat component of the divergence operator acts only on the R hat component here. So that's why you don't see an R hat sticking out here. And another thing I did is I went ahead and distributed it out, this one over R, to all the components, and that's what you see here. Uh, the reason why that matters is because they, we have a partial with respect to R on the R hat component, and so that's where this one over R comes from right here. All right, so let's go ahead and start working on this. Um, the first thing that we can do is just start cleaning up things. So before this partial derivative with respect to R hits this, uh, this uh, relationship here, we can go ahead and cancel out this one over R. And then turn out that into one. Another thing that we got is that um, this is a partial with respect to phi. And we have a sine theta here. So this sine theta can move outside of that partial or it can now cancel out with that one over sine theta from the um, divergence operator. All right. So we'll go ahead and go to this next dot and start cleaning things up a little bit more. We have our k, our square bracket. And uh, we can go ahead and just figure this as one over r, or, yeah, one over r squared because this is a ddr uh, partial ddr attacking a uh, well, just an r so the derivative of r is, respect to r is just one so that's why we just have that comp constant right here and then um let's go ahead and um again this is a whoops <laughs> that is erased this is a partial in respect to phi um theta here so we can go ahead and pull out the um the sine of phi right here so we'll have sine phi over one over sine theta and uh, we'll just go ahead and leave our partial respect to theta right here. Another thing that we can do is, since this is a partial respect to theta, we can pull this one over r out. So this will turn into one over r squared. So we have a squared right here. Oh my god. Sorry about that. That was kind of weird. All right. Um, over r squared. Oh boy, it's starting to do it. All right. This is not a good good notes app demonstration right here hopefully it keeps going up all right so um so now that we pulled out the sine phi and the r we're just left with this we can go ahead and combine these two um uh, one of our uh, uh, sine squares and we can go ahead and pull out this two right here so pull out that two put it out here in front two now we have a sine squared of phi times cosine of phi and then finally on this uh, last one, we have one over r squared because we can go ahead and pull out that one over r here and just a partial in respect to phi of cosine phi. And I'll just go ahead and put that as, a, um, so it's actually negative sine phi, but we'll just go ahead and move this um, negative sign out in front here. All right, so I already starting to get kind of small. That's pretty good. Uh, next thing we'll really look at is this one. So when this partial attacks here, uh, we're going to have to do the uh, chain rule where we take a derivative of this uh, plus a derivative of that. Shouldn't be too bad. Square. This all largely stays the same. You can already tell this sign theta here is just waiting to cancel out something whenever it pops out. So I'll go ahead and do our parentheses and write out our uh, chain rule. So we have a 
we'll go ahead and do the sine squared. So derivative with respect to theta of sine squared theta is two sine theta times cosine. So we have two cosines now. So we'll go ahead and turn that into a cosine squared um, plus the derivative of sine squared times cosine uh, cosine theta. And the derivative of cosine theta is just negative sine theta. So we'll just go ahead and turn this into a negative sine theta. And there was already a sine squared theta over here, so we'll do that into a, geez, a uh, sine cubed theta, geez. And, uh, you know, I'll wait till the very end of this. I'll go ahead and rewrite this out. All right, so what we recognize here is that there's a sine theta common to these two, so we can go ahead and factor it out. And like I said, this sine theta is just waiting to cancel out these. So this will, um, this sine theta goes to one, this three becomes a two. And um, now we can just go ahead and rewrite this everything and just let it be a little bit cleaner here. Totally forgot to say I canceled that out, my bad. So there's an r squared underneath. We're left with a two cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. So any time that you have a cosine squared um, being added or subtracted to a sine squared of the same variable, uh, spidey senses for the double angle formula should be uh, standing up in the back of your neck. Um, but before we even get to that, we can go ahead and um, just distribute this two into here, and I'll show you why a little bit. So we're gonna go ahead and throw that two into those. So we'll have a, co or a four cosine squared theta minus two sine squared theta minus one over r squared. I'm just, you know, I'm just gonna put this, I'm gonna place this sine phi right on top of r squared just to save me one stroke of a one. All right, so now immediately what you can see is that this is a common factor of this. So we could go ahead and factor that out now, but before I, uh, we'll do that in the next step. So this will just end up turning into like a minus one and then we'll have a sine squared times all this other stuff here. But before I do this, I'm just gonna go ahead and look at this. What we can do here is uh, we can go ahead and use the double angle formula. So double angle, double angle, specifically we're going to be, uh, use one is equal to two cosine squared theta minus cosine two theta. The reason why we're going to do that is then we can start, um, we're going to, we're going to factor this one out. So then there's going to be a one sitting here and then we're going to make that one and turn it into all this. So we can start canceling out everything in here. So let me go ahead and do that. This will make more sense when I do a little bit more of an explicit um, write out here. So sine phi over r squared. So again, we're pulling these out of both of those, having them sit out here in front. And then we're gonna have like a big parentheses for cosine, hang in there, cosine, <laughs> a little bit backwards, to sine squared theta minus one, all right? Because like I said, we just factored everything out. Now we can make um, that substitution for this one, turn this one into all this. So of course, this will be a negative and this will be a plus since it's a negative one. So we'll just do that in this next step. And you know what, just to save me time from writing things, I'm just gonna copy and paste things. Because this is uh, 2021 and um, we have the power to copy and paste things like that. Okay, so let's go ahead and make this substitution uh, right here. I should draw a line here to say that's specifically where we made that substitution, actually, right there. Um, so this one will go away, and we'll do minus uh, the negative, or so minus all of these, so it'd be um, two, whoops, two cosine squared theta minus, so it's really a plus because there's a minus sign sitting out front, all right, all right. So now we can start using these to go after uh, and chop down all these trigonometric identities that we originally had. 
Um, so let's see here. We'll just go ahead and turn this turn this four cosine squared into just a two cosine squared once we subtract um, that one from there. So let's, um, I'll just go ahead and write it in blue. So this will turn into a two. This whole thing will go into a zero. Uh, let's just go ahead and make it the next step. So this was a two now. Our, um, oops, that should have been a bracket up there. My bad, and a bracket here. Um, this thing is spared, and we still have a two cosine, um, uh, a two cosine theta. Or, oh my gosh, cosine two theta um, being a little strap hanger out right here. And now we can use another version of the double angle formula right here. I'll go ahead and write it off to the side here where cosine squared or cosine two theta is equal to cosine squared two theta. And um, I do not have these memorized. Don't think I'm smart like that. I just, when I see, again, like I see when I see cosine squared sine squared of thetas, um, I always just Google what are all the double angle formulas. Uh, anyway, so we can just go ahead and make this substitution here where this is actually like a two times cosine squared of theta minus sine squared theta, right? Which just so happens to be what we have over here. So we can just combine these into two cosine theta, which just happens to be what we have over here. So let's go ahead and do that. Could have copied and pasted. But, you know, I guess we'll do all over again. So now uh, we'll go ahead and make that substitution. So we have a two cosine two theta minus Oh, uh, you know what? I sorry. This is a plus. Plus, cosine two theta. Good to see real time um, uh, uh, corrections here. So this all ends up being a three cosine two theta. And uh, one of the other things that we can do is uh, so there will be a three sticking out over here. Uh, yeah, I'll just go ahead and do it explicitly. Or this is going to get kind of confusing. So. You see what I'm getting at here. Now we can factor out this three over r squared, and that leaves us with something nice and pretty. So three k over r squared, one plus sine phi cosine two theta. All right, so that when we're done taking the divergence, I think that's pretty much as, as much as we can get to simplify, but we're not done yet. Uh, remember, this is still all equal to the divergence of E, right? And that is equal to the charge density times the proportion of the constant of 1 over epsilon naught. So this is what we're searching for. So we just need to multiply all of this by epsilon naught, right, to get our charge density. So, of course, I mean, we can go, just go ahead and copy and paste this. So we know that, oh, come on. The charge density is just equal to all epsilon naught times all of this, and that is our answer.